hello learners today <clears throat> i am here with my uh, second topic in the series types of poetry last time we discussed uh, the lyric and types of poetry the first type and today i am going to take ode and somehow i didn't take sonnet because i feel like ode should be taken first and then sonnet and sonnet is somehow a long topic also so next time the sonnet will be there so let's start with today's topic uh, that is the ode you might have listened to this term the ode many times while going through the text of the literature or uh, any summary or any analysis or you might have heard the famous ode ode to the west wind by pb shelley so there are so many odes and whenever this term comes so what are the technicalities behind this term let us discuss this thoroughly so let's start with the uh, term the ode the question may arise in our mind that uh, what an ode means so ode is a long lyric poem that is serious in subject and treatment elevated in style and elaborate in a stanzaic structure so the first thing we need to understand about ode is that it is a part of the lyric lyric is the parent form and ode is one of them but as we had discussed lyric earlier so what is the difference between ode and a lyric is that ode is somehow a serious subject it treats with a serious subject it is longer than the lyric and it is in a manner a uh, very elaborated in its structure and its style is elevated a style is elevated means the style is somehow uh, you know of high standard the words the diction and the rhyme and rhythm patterns are well taken care of so elevated style and elaborated in a manner second thing which comes there is often in the form of an address and sometimes used to commemorate an important public occasion see whenever we have gone through the ode there are always some addresses in initial stage or in the first line or in the beginning lines of the ode it means it is always to address somebody and or some event or some person or any one but ode is always in the form of address mostly uh mostly ode is written in a address form third is what was the origin of ode ode was originated again it is of greek origin and like its parent form lyric it is always originated in greek and if we talk about the prototype the prototype was developed by pindar who was a famous classical poet of greece and pindar was the person who used to sing or who used to create odes and for the choruses which was sung during the drama in uh, classical time and uh, pindar odes were modeled on the songs by the chorus in greek drama so pindar was the person who actually established an ode in its form so let us discuss about the characteristics of an ode what are the features which distinguishes ode from lyric or from other forms of the poetry so if we go through it minutely we'll find certain differences number one difference is it is exalted in subject matter and elevated in tone and style means its subject matter is not a simple one it is somehow a good and serious subject matter and its tone and style will be elevated 
means it will be not a common form of poetry like we will be very conscious while choosing the words while choosing the diction or while choosing the rhymes or a kind of you know style in the poetry and the poet is always about a serious subject and its presentation would also be very grave its presentation will not be like in general sense its presentation would be in a very serious manner let us differentiate it with an example you know that wordsworth has written many poems but when we see the difference so we'll find that the style of wordsworth poem on simple country scenes is on one side and if we talk of his ode on the intimations of immortality it stands quite different here this matter is very grave serious and the choice of subjects and the diction chosen is somehow very much ele elevated and elaborated so we'll find that how an an ode stands quite apart from the simple one where we feel like that no seriousness is required wherever in the case of ode a great seriousness is required and this is the feature which actually distinguishes it from other features of the poetry second characteristics if we talk about ode is that it is longer than the lyric proper for the emotion it embodies is if of a kind that admits admits of a development that for an ode to develop to come in its full swing you know we need somehow a longer form because it takes time it takes time to develop in its full form to justify with the emotions with the address with the poet has started or initiated so it takes a long swing or a long time to develop that's why it is somehow an elaborated form is always longer than the lyric and it may be full of deep and sincere emotion but its expression is expected to be much more consciously elaborate it is not so that it goes spontaneously from the heart of the poet rather poet is very conscious while writing an ode and he deliberately keeps or selects and keep in keep a choice of that elaborated impressive and other uh, expressions which will make ultimately the ode uh, somehow elevated in style number 3 is unlike other forms of verse it is often addressed directly to the being or object it treats of the opening lines sometimes contain an apostrophe or appeal which is characteristic of the whole treatment of the poem generally whenever ode is beginning in the initial line we'll find that the very subject matter or the very person to which the ode is there it is always it is always starting with an address to that very person or to that subject to which it is devoted for example if we take some of the poems famous odes will find that for example if we take shelley's ode to the west wind it begins like this o wild west wind this is the apostrophe which is used by the poet apostrophe is a figure of a speech where we address somebody and an exclamation mark is there at the last again one more example is john keats ode on gratian and which starts like that thou still unravished bride of quietness which is totally addressing the gratian and about which the keats is talking about in the whole poem the same with tennyson's ode is there to virgil roman virgil thou that singest if we take the fourth characteristic that says sometimes the ode has for its theme an important public event 
like a national jubilee the death of a distinguished personage the commemoration of the founding of a great university many times odes are written to commemorate great person great personalities sometimes when a festive season or some celebration or some national jubilee sort of things are being organized the odes are also written on that matter for example if we take marvel's ode that is upon cromwell's return from ireland this is to commemorate you know oliver cromwell who was called as lord protector of england and in the memory of that actually marvel wrote it so it was to commemorate oliver cromwell the same way tennyson's ode on the death of the duke of wellington so these odes are based on commemoration of individual so odes are used to commemorate people and to celebrate some uh, great celebration also now the question arises in our mind that like the lyric is there any categorization of ode or are there types of ode of course there are types of ode and there are three types of ode which are majorly concerned and uh, these three types of ode has a kind of sequential development it will be very conspicuous when you go through the history of odes so let us take one by one these three types are called at uh, number 1 the ode which is supposed to be at number 1 is called the form the pindaric ode it is also called by two other names one is the pindaric and second is the dorian ode and third is the regular ode the second type is the horatian ode it has again other name which, by which it is pronounced and this name is the lesbian so there are two names for the second type the horatian or the lesbian and third type is the irregular ode and sometimes it is also called as the kaulean ode abraham kaule by the name of abraham kaule it is known as kaulean ode so let us elaborate upon these three types one by one let us take the first pindaric ode it is known as pindaric due to its brilliant use by greek classicist poet pindar who was there in greece in 552 bc to 442 bc so pindar was the person who actually made it famous and that's why it is named as pindaric then why it is called as dorian actually dorian is one dialect which is spoken in some area of greece and due to its name dorian dialect it is also known as dorian ode now the question come in our mind why it is called regular ode because it has a regular sequence in its structure it follows a structure which takes a sequence of strophe antistrophe and epode stanzas and what are these stanzas we are going to discuss in further slides then pindaric ode initiated with the chorus which was sung during the drama and it was always sung with a, an accompaniment of music and here one more thing comes that is the dance dance was also there in pindaric ode and uh, music of course was there and dance was there pindaric now a very important point that pindaric ode since the uh since its origin from greek greece when comes to england who was the person which was the first ode which was pindaric ode which was introduced in england and who was responsible for it so um students you can note down that it is very important point that pindaric ode was introduced in england by ben johnson and the ode which he has written to introduce it in england was to the immortal memory and friendship of that noble pair sir lucius carey and sir h morrison and this ode was written in 1629 so it is very important that ben johnson actually 
brought Pindari code in England or introduced England with the Pindari code. Now come to the structure of Pindari code which is of great importance and significance. So please note it down that it has a regular stanza pattern and these three uh, stanza pattern always being repeated in that. So first stanza is called strophe and in that stanza it is sung when the dancer makes a turn from right to left means it is an anti-clockwise turn from the dancer while dancing and strophe is being recited at that particular time. Come to the second stanza which is called anti-strophe. By the name it is very conspicuous that it is anti-strophe. Means it is recited when the dancer makes a counter, counter turn from left to right. Means it is clockwise turn. So dancer is dancing from left to right while it is being sung and third is a pole and this is stanza is recited when the dancer is stood still dancer is still neither he is taking turn from right to left or left to right rather he has become still and song is going on so these three stanzas are the main structure of the old and Generally, it is asked always in exam these structures and uh, what are the turn and moves of the dancer during this recitation of this structure. And now one question may arise in a student's mind that whether these stanzas are being repeated in an old. Yes, the sequence of strophe and dystrophe and a pole could be repeated any number of times in an old. It is not in hard, a hard and fast rule. If a poet feels like he can repeat it many times so there is no uh, strict rules regarding this uh, we may take one example that uh, in Thomas Gray's ode the progress of poesy and the bard both are very famous ode uh, and among the most successful uh, imitation of Pindari uh, uh, sorry uh, among the most successful uh, imitation of odes in English literature. So in both the odes, this sequence is repeated severally many times. So it is one of the example. And uh, one most important thing is that Pindaric odes were encomiastic. What is this term encomiastic means? That is, if we try to find its meaning that they were written to praise and glorify someone. So always some ode is encomiastic when it is used for glorifying or praising somebody. And when Pindar used this particular quality of ode, at that time, it was used to celebrate the victories of athlete in Olympic Games during that time. So we used to praise the athletes when they used to become victorious in their games. So it started like that. Now come to the second type, Horatian Ode. Now as the name says Horatian, so it starts with the, again one more Greek that was Horace and you all are very well acquainted with the name Horace. Orig originally modeled on the matter, tone and form of the odes of the Roman Horace. So whatever odes Horace practiced, he was a Roman. During 65 BC to 8 BC, he was there and whatever he practiced, when it was followed by other, so it was termed as Horatian Ode. And there is a great difference between Horatian and Pindari code. In contrast to the passion, visionary boldness and formal, formal language of Pindar sports, many Horatian odes are calm, meditative and colloquial. Means here, compromise is there. Pindaric ode on one hand is so much elevated and grand in style and serious in matter. But here, a chance or uh, you can say that 
a compromise can be done in Horus ode because Horatian odes are on one hand very calm, not very serious. They are meditative and colloquial. Colloquial term is used when uh, we use that uh, kind of you know uh, uh, words or language which is commonly uh, being practiced in this in a society so in that we can take any words uh, from the society or uh, those words even which are out of date and which were used earlier in times so we are not very serious about the elevated style or manner so somehow you can say that horatian is a compromise form not very serious or elevated in style this form was popularized by two great roman writers one was Horace, obviously, and second was Catullus, C-A-T-U-L-L-U-S. <clears throat> Both the um, writers were responsible for making it famous. Uh, one more thing is there. It is also known by other name, Lesbian Ode. Why is this called Lesbian Ode? This has nothing to take with that uh, gender criticism, which we say it lesbianism. Rather, actually, Lesbos... Uh, was an island over there island of lesbos was there and it was the place where it was originally flourished that's why it is called lesbian odes also now come to the structure of Hor uh, Horace ode Horatian ode it consists of a number of short stanzas similar in length and arrangement there are short stanzas generally of four lines each and they are uh, arranged uh, you know they are of similar line, line and length and they are arranged uh, sequentially these stanzas are usually <coughs> homostrophic homostrophic is again one more term which needs to be understand and it means that when single repeated stanza form is being pra practiced in some poetry it is called homostrophic so odes uh, Horatian odes are homostrophic in nature and single repeated stanza form we can say that it is written in single repeated stanza form and the treatment is direct and dignified and the thought clearly developed here we direct treat with the poem we are not very conscious about making it uh, very elevated or super form uh, but Horace is very important writer or Horatian ode is very important to be discussed as that it served as a model to English imitators of the form and English odes of this type are commonly known as Horatian odes. Actually, later uh, many writers practiced this form, Horatian form in England also. Why have writers practiced this form? The answer is that that it is somehow an easier form rather than uh, you know a Pindari code which was always having some strict classical uh, rules or criteria. So it was uh, rather comparatively it was easier to practice and it was somehow you know direct in appealing. So that's why most of the person in England also practiced Horatian old greatly. Now come to the final type of the ode that is the irregular ode. With the name again it is obvious that irregularity of stanza pattern is there. That's why it is irregular ode. And Abraham Cowley introduced this in 1656 in England. That's why it is also called Cow Cowleyan ode. Uh, he imitated the Pindaric style means he copied the Pindaric style in end matter but disregarded the recurrent stanzaic pattern in each strophic triad instead but he didn't take the sequence of regular stanza pattern means strophe anti-strophe or report rather he allowed each stanzas to establish establish its own pattern of varying lines all stanzas uh, you know developed itself with varying lines pattern length number of lines and rhyme scheme there was nothing fixed then <coughs> this type of irregular stanzaic structure which is free to alter in accordance with shifts in subject and mood has been the most common for the English old. 
सो दिस टाइप ऑफ पैटर्न वॉज वेरी कॉमन इन इंग्लिश ओल्ड ऑल्सो इंग्लिश इन इंग्लैंड ऑल्सो दिस ओल्ड वॉज प्रैक्टिस एंड इफ वी टेक दर एग्जाम्पल ऑफ वर्ड्स वॉज ओल्ड to intimations of mortality it is also representative of the irregular ode so uh horatian ode as well as the irregular ode due to its elasticity due to its uh, freedom the poet uh, feel while writing uh was or have been a favorite of many english writer also so these were the three odes basically and after clarifying these all uh, differences uh, students we can have a clear cut idea about uh, the the difference between the odes and why these odes are pra practiced and why these odes are not practiced so uh, all answers we can have after going through these uh, types of odes and we can have a clear picture of odes the references uh, are again the wikipedia a background to english literature by b prasad and daily poetry a glossary of literary terms by m h abrams and oxford book of literary terms so i would suggest to take this book or to buy this book m h abrams a glossary of literary terms which can help you while preparing in net exam also and uh, while understanding some of the difficult topic or uh complex literary terms for your m exams also i hope that you enjoyed this and uh see you uh with the new lecture uh in the type of poetry and it will be uh, based on the sonnets till then thanks a lot have a nice day